think about uh, different thoughts of the tabernacle, but God took two chapters and began to instruct the children of Israel just about the one garment that the priest was supposed to wear. And tonight I want to preach to, uh, on the robes of the priest. Exodus 29, if you're able to, let's stand together and read a portion of the Word of God, Exodus chapter 29. I'm directing your attention in verse number 4, where the Bible says, And Aaron and his sons, thou shalt bring into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt wash them with water. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod, and the ephod and the breastplate, and gird him with the courteous girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the mire upon his head, and put a holy crown upon the mire. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil, and pour it upon his head, and anoint him. And thou shalt bring his sons, and put coats on them. And thou shalt gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and the bonnets on them. And the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statue. And thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons. If you notice verse 5, I'm looking at this one thought. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod. Tonight I want to preach on the priest's garments. Just before I preach tonight, if any of the men would like, let's join around the altar, have a word of prayer, ask and help tonight, and then we'll preach the message of the Word of God. Any of the men that like to join with me, let's ask help tonight from the Lord. Our Heavenly Father and our God, we sure are grateful this evening we can assemble under this tent. Lord, thank you for each one that's come out, Lord, this evening. And Lord, as this already been mentioned, Lord, we sure are grateful for the beautiful weather that you've given. Father, we're grateful for the good time of fellowship we've been able to enjoy. And Lord, just uh, a little thought of what heaven's going to be like as we're able to enjoy the fellowship of one with another. And Lord, how beautiful heaven must be, Lord, as once when we get there and the good time we can have together. But Lord, just to be with you, what a day that will be. But Father, tonight we've gathered this evening, we've sung some songs, we've listened to the music, and Father, tonight I pray you might bless now in the preaching of the Word of God. And Lord, you know each person that's under this tent. You know each person that's able to hear tonight. I pray, God, that you might work in hearts and lives. And as we look at the priestly robes, Lord, this evening, I pray you might show us a truth found in the Word of God. And Father, may your will be done. I pray you might help me as I preach the message of the Word of God. And I'll thank you and praise you, Lord, for all that you've done. Thank you for being so good to us. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I appreciate you men gathering with me tonight at the altar. There's a lot that can be mentioned about the priest's garment. There's some things in the Word of God that uh, has a lot of different details, a lot of different little details. And many times when we read the Word of God, many times we overlook it. Many times we're not really looking at all the different details we're reading it. Might be you get up in the morning and there might still be some sleep in your eye and you're in Exodus 29 and here it is you begin to read and as you read some of the details just doesn't come out. And I'm just noticing just a few different thoughts in regards to this priest's garment. Now let me just say, there's three different types of priests from what I find in the Word of God. We have just the normal priests that we find here mentioned, and these were the sons of Aaron. As I'm thinking for just a moment, they were the only ones that could actually be the priests in that area. Here it is, uh, the, the more children they had, the more opportunity for different ones to become priests. And, and these different ones were the ones that ministered the holy things of God. It was the Levi priests. I'm thinking for just a moment when things were being transported. Remember they were in the wilderness and they would uh, move from one spot to another and, and it was the Levi priests that would go ahead and run the uh, poles through. They all, all the different furnitures had a, a rings and they would run the poles through it, put it on their shoulders and they would carry it, carry the Ark of the Covenant, many other different things. They would pack the boards. It was the Levi priests that did all that. And so we have the priests that came from the line of Aaron. But then we have what's known as a high priest. 
And here we notice Aaron was the very first one, according to Josephus. I don't know if anybody ever read Josephus. He was a historian. But he said from the time of Aaron all the way up to the life of Christ, there was something like 80 different high priests that held that office. And here they were the ones involved in the part where they would anoint it and put the blood on the mercy seat. It was the high priest that would do that. And I'm thinking for just a moment, the only way to lose that job was through death. You couldn't just say, well, I'm tired of this. I'm going to go get a new occupation. Here, uh, they were the high priest all the way up to death. And then we notice there's another type. We have the priest, the high priest. And then we have today the great high priest. Now, unlike the other ones, he's not out of the tribe of Levi. He's out of the tribe of Judah. He came from a totally different tribe. He inherited from none other. He has never passed it down because the only way you can pass it down is to die. And I want you to know that high priest is still alive today. He's Man. still seated at the Father's right hand. And I want you to know he's not planning on changing the office at any time. But we notice this is the great high priest. I'm thinking about a verse of scripture tonight before I preach on the priestly robes. I'm thinking about a verse in 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse number 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. It's amazing to me that God has considered us as priests. We're a royal priesthood according to the word of God. I'm noticing some different things here about the priest. Let me give you real quickly before I get into the main part of the message. You know, sometimes preaching, it's like riding in an airplane. It takes a little bit to taxi off. You know what I'm talking about? Here it is, boy, get up in the air, you're, you're sore and you're doing well. But sometimes it takes a while just to taxi off and get down the runway. Well, we're gonna, it's going to take a little bit to get down the runway. I'm thinking for a moment, if a person was a priest, I noticed the first thing. This is found in chapter 28, verse 1. I noticed there was a call to the priest. God was the one that placed them in the ministry. God was the one that called them. And here he put them in the ministry. This is going to bother some folks, but they never voted on it. Uh oh. They never had a business meeting. Who are we going to put in next as the priest? That would ruin some of our churches today. <laughs> I'm thinking for a moment, here God was the one, and, and I'm thinking for just a moment, I, as, as I'm standing here, I'm not a person that's called because dad was a preacher. I'm not a person that's called to preach because mama wanted a boy that preached. I want you to know, I believe it's important that you and I, when we're called to do something, we do the will of God in our lives. They were called. He says, Thou shalt take Aaron, thy brother, and his sons, in chapter 28, verse 1, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me. God was the one that placed them in the ministry. God was the one that put them there. God was the one that called him to do the work that he's doing. I'm thankful for the calling that was given first to the place. I notice in chapter 29, in verse number four, in order for a priest to do their job, not only were they called, and I'm just giving you a quick introduction, they were also cleansed. If you notice in verse four, Aaron and his son shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt wash them with water. It's interesting here, we're talking about someone that has been cleansed on the street that's drunk and laying in the gutter, and all of a sudden, Sunday and I want to go ahead and sing in the choir. I want to go ahead and, and uh, do some testify. No, they were cleaned up. They're no longer living the way everybody else has lived. They've been cleaned up. And could I say ye are a royal priesthood. I believe it's high time that the church of the living God begins to clean their lives up. I believe this world is looking for something different and we need some Christians that are just get clean in the eyes of this world. I'm noticing they were clean. It's interesting that they were cleaned with water. It wasn't just a little sponge bath. They were cleaned with water. As I'm thinking for just a moment, and uh, you can turn with me if you will, John chapter number 15. Would you notice a verse of scripture with me in John chapter number 15? I'm talking about a cleansing. 
In John chapter number 15, if you'll notice with me what Jesus says in verse number 3, he makes mention, now ye are clean, notice this, word which I have spoken unto you. Isn't it amazing? He said the way we get clean is through the word. You know, when you read Ephesians 5, he might sanctify the church by the washing of the word. You know what cleans a person up? It's, oh, coming to church is great. I'm, I'm thankful when we come to church, we can learn, we can listen, we, we can take heed, we can go ahead and, and do some things, change some things in our lives. But it's the Word of God that cleans us up. It was the Word of God that went ahead and showed me things. And, and begin to look in the Word of God, and my, it begins to clean me. He says, you're clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Even in Psalm 119, verse 9, it says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way. You say, Brother Aguiar, how can a young person be clean before God? It's easy by taking heed thereunto according to thy Word. You see, the Word of God is what cleans us up. And here I will say this, this washing was public. It wasn't just a private washing. Oh no, it was a public washing. You say, what are you saying? If we're a royal priesthood, everybody in this community ought to see we're living a clean life. Everybody in this community ought to see we're living right. Hey, listen, if you have a job, you ought to give the best you can to that job. You ought not to be known as lazy. You ought not to be known as a, as a bum on the job. You ought to do the best. Why? You should be cleaned up. You're a royal priesthood. I noticed they were called. I noticed they were cleansed. And then in verse, tw uh, back in Exodus 29, verse 5 and 6, they then became clothed. I'm thinking for just a moment, weren't the clothes that Aaron wore good enough? The answer is no. God says here when they come in, I want you to put something else on them. I want them to be clothed. I, I want you to put a garment. I want you to put the, co the, the coat on them. Put the robe of the ephod. Put the breastplate. Gird on them. Have the girdle. The whole night. Here it is. He wanted them clothed. Would you turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. There's a evil teaching that is going across America. And because of it hitting many of the churches, we have churches today, if you walk in, you're not sure if you walked into a country club or if you walked into a church. No. And the teaching is this. And I'll say this. The devil will provide some truth with some lie if he can get you to believe a lie. And so he'll use a verse of Scripture in 1 Samuel that looks at the heart. You probably read that. You probably read it in the Word of God when God told Samuel to go and anoint King David. And here he said, don't look at the stature, don't look at anything, because God looks at the heart. And with that teaching, many folks say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter how you dress. It doesn't matter how this goes on or that. God's looking at the heart. Well, I'm just thinking for a moment in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I hope you're there tonight. If you notice with me in verse 20, the Bible says, For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God... Notice this next phrase, in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Not only should our, we be glorifying God in our spirit, within our heart, and, and within the uh, innermost being of us, what, what our desires are on the inside and, and what our wants are on the inside, not only should that be glorifying God, but it should be that our bodies are glorifying to the Lord. I'm thinking for just a moment because of the teaching that many folks just hold and all they do is look at God looks at the heart. Today, we step into churches and we're not even sure what, if folks are Christians. I believe it makes a difference. Here, God said, I want you to clothe there. And there in chapter 28 of Exodus, he makes mention uh, in verse 3 to make Aaron's garments that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. I, I pastored a church over in Germany for many years. As I was a pastor there, the church was a mostly military church. Some, we have maybe some different military folks here. You used to be in the military. Could you imagine if we had military people right now, and here it is, formation starts. 
Here it is. You get up at 5.30. Formations at 6. Could you imagine seeing all the different men? Here they're supposed to be dressed. They're supposed to be ready. They're supposed to be standing at attention. Could you imagine someone deciding, well, I think I'm just going to go, uh, go on into work in a T-shirt and a pair of blue jeans. Mm. You think they're going to last long? You think something wouldn't be said? The moment here, because of their position and their job, there was a uniform expected. Even today, we have different ones that's in uniform. You know, whenever I'm driving down the road, and if I see some lights come behind me, and they're blue and they're red, I pull over, they pull over. Don't happen much. But all of a sudden, somebody gets out, and I'm just being honest with you, if they're in a pair of blue jeans and a T-shirt, I'm not going to listen to them. I'm looking for something else. I'm looking for a badge. I'm looking for a uniform. You say, why? Because it holds authority. And I'm thinking, here it is. God said, Aaron, whatever you're wearing, I want you to know here, when you come and minister, when you come to do my work, I want you to be clothed. I'm going to give you a different garment. I'm going to give you something different. And here in chapter 28, verse 3, he said, make Aaron garments. He says that he might minister unto me. Can I say this? If you're going to be a witness to this lost world, you need to look like a Christian. I'm thinking about those that just need to show Christ. I'm just giving a quick introduction. I hope it's quick tonight. I notice in here they were called. I notice they were uh, clothed. I notice they were cleansed. And, and then in chapter 29 of the book of Exodus, they were consecrated. In verse 9, thou shalt gird, gird them with girdles. Aaron and his sons put on the bonnets on them. The priest's office shall be in there, uh, be there for a perpetual statue. Thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons. You say, Brother Aguirre, what does it mean, consecrate? Well, every now and then we sing the song, Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord. I'm thinking here, it's the action of making or declaring something. Here, God was declaring him that he would be a priest. And I want you to know, God has went ahead. When we got saved, he clothed us in a robe of righteousness. When God looks upon us, he does not see our sin. Hallelujah. But I believe you and I, we ought to live that other folks might see Christ. Here, we've been named with the name of Christ. So we notice they were called, they were cleansed, they were clothed, they were consecrated, they were even compassionate. There in Hebrews chapter 5, it makes mention about the priest, and it says, who can have compassion on the ignorant? Now I'm honest. I try to be as compassionate as possible. I'm around people every day. I'm around different churches every day. And here it is, I preach my heart out and I give the word of God out and then all of a sudden here it is, you see folks not wanting to live right. And I have to admit, that gets a preacher a little furious. Here it is, you've given out the word of God and folks don't want to live right. But I notice that the priest has compassion. And though many folks might not listen, though many folks might not uh, hear the word of God, they might turn it off, but yet I still want to have compassion. There's folks that come to our, church, our tent meetings, and my, I preach the word of God. I give the word of God in salvation. I try to get folks to come and get saved, and yet folks make a decision. No, I don't want it. I'll do it later. Maybe some other time. And my, they leave. Hey, listen, I don't want to get angry with those folks. I don't want to get upset. I want to show compassion. And here with the priest, they had to have have compassion. Sometimes we look at folks and because they don't look like us, we don't have compassion. Sometimes people walk into church and maybe they don't look the way you do. Maybe they're not dressed the way you are. Maybe, they're, maybe there's markings all over them. And boy, the first thing we do is turn our holy nose up in the air. Could I say that's ungodly? We need to have compassion. Amen. I start to think about somebody that had compassion one day. In fact, Romans 5 verse 8 has said, But God commended His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, when I start thinking about the Lord, I think about His compassion. He should have thrown me into hell. He should have placed me into hell a long time ago. Oh, but He had compassion on me. And I believe tonight here, we need to have compassion. 
So I'm just noticing these thoughts of the priests, how they're called, how they're, uh, uh, how they're clothed, how they're cleansed, how they're consecrated, how they have compassion. But I want you to notice three different parts of the garment tonight. And I want to give you three thoughts about the garment. The first one we find in Exodus chapter number 39. And if you'll notice with me, Exodus 39, God spent two chapters about the garment that they were supposed to wear. The first thing I notice in chapter 39, verse th uh, 27, they made coats of fine linen of woolen work for Aaron and his son. Here, this was a fine linen. This was a beautiful, bright white color that they would go ahead and place on them. This was the linen garment that Aaron and his, uh, and his uh, uh, sons would wear, this fine linen garment. Now, I got a good question. They traveled in the wilderness. Do you think they had a Joanne's fabric there? I don't know what other fabric stores around. That's the only one I can think of. Do you think they was able to get online and be able to order some fabric in wherever they was headed to their next destination? My question is, where did they get the fine linen garment? I'm thinking, where did it come from? Can I remind you, according to what we read, uh, what we've seen in the Word of God last year, I preached on it a little bit. But when the children of Israel left the land of Egypt. The Bible says that the Egyptians spoiled them. They gave them jewels. They gave them garments. They gave them a lot of different things. In the midst of that, the, the Egyptians gave them linen. You can read it, Exodus chapter 3, verse 22. Here they spoiled the, 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 the children of Israel, and my, they took these garments. I'm thinking about this fine white garment. As I'm thinking about this garment, I also noticed that uh, this garment was from the top all the way down to the bottom of the foot. I'm thinking about how it clothed them completely. Do you realize the day you got saved, that robe of righteousness that God gave you, he covered you completely? You say, what about the sins that I committed in my past? They're all gone. They're covered. What about the sins that maybe I did today? They're all covered. What about the sins in, my, in the future that I might do? They're all covered from the top all the way to the bottom. It's showing the pure uh, robe that is given. It's showing the righteousness. Oh, it's like that robe that we read of in Revelation chapter 1 of the Lord Jesus. He has a white robe from the top all the way down, showing that he is pure all the way. This was the fine linen garment. As I look at this word coat, and the Bible said about this linen garment that was a coat, it is the same Hebrew word that's used in the book of Genesis chapter 3, where God made coats of skin and clothed Adam and Eve. The same wording of this coat, the same thought of what it does, the same thought... That and here, Aaron, when he ministered before the Lord, the righteousness of God. Hey, listen, I'm not ministering here tonight in my own righteousness. I'm not doing this because this is what Del Aguiar wants. Oh, but I'm doing it because God was the one that called me. God was the one that placed me in the ministry. God was the one. I'm only standing here because of God's righteousness. That's right. Could I say, if you're a Sunday school teacher... And my, as the children come in, they assemble into the classroom, they sit down there, or maybe if you got a teen class or you got an adult class, whatever it is, I don't know how the classes are here at this church, but could I say you ought to be in God's righteousness. They ought to see a teacher that is pure. They ought to see a teacher that loves God, a teacher that wants to serve God. There ought to be a white linen garment there, spiritually speaking, that the Bible mentions. Isaiah 61, verse 10, I'll greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful for God, for he hath clothed me with the garment of salvation, covered me with a robe of righteousness. I'm thinking tonight about this linen garment. So if we was to look at Aaron, here there's a garment from the top all the way to the bottom, white linen. Then we notice in Exodus chapter 28, in verse 31, thou shalt make, a, uh, make the robe of the ephod all of blue. Now it is interesting, this ephod came around 
and it went ahead and covered part of it. Now keep in mind he had the main garment on. But this would be somewhat like a vest type setup, a little bit longer, a little bit more, uh, covering just a little more here. And it was all of blue. I'm thinking for just a moment if it was a black or if it was a gray, it would probably show judgment. But it wasn't a black or it wasn't a gray. It's interesting, it's a garment of blue. When you think of blue, all of a sudden you begin to think of royalty. Like I said, black or gray, it would seem like judgment. We, we see gray clouds that come in. We see the black clouds that come in. And it just seems like a, uh, there, there's a, a wind, there's destruction, there's things like that. But here it's blue. It's showing royalty. It's interesting, these uh, many seamstress that might be here tonight, it's interesting to know it's without a seam. Can you imagine here this ephod is placed on air and it doesn't have one C? Can you imagine that? I'm just thinking for a moment what the Bible's mentioning here. Yeah, but there was a hole in the top where the head would pass through and this ephod would go ahead and slip over the head of Aaron and Maya would begin to cover him, showing the royalty of God. I'm just thinking about this and as it came down longer... There were pomegranates. And they say they were made of blue, purple, and scarlet. And here they were placed all along the bottom of the, that, uh, that ephod. And I, I'm just thinking for a moment, in between those pomegranates, there were gold bales. And I started to think about these gold bales. Each one had a different sound. Now, you can get the same bells together, and, and uh, you say they sound identical, but really, when you really put a, a true meter on it, they're all a little bit different. Some are more stronger. Some are a little bit less strong. Some have a, a, a brazen sound. Some have a bold sound. And I'm just thinking, sometimes when two bells each other. They don't sound too good. I'm just thinking about this. You take two bells and clang them together, sometimes it's not as good of a sound as when they're without hitting each other. It's amazing that God placed the bell, a pomegranate, a bell, a pomegranate, a bell, a pomegranate, and that's the way he did it all the way around. And so as Aaron ministered before the Lord, what he did, he would walk in that tabernacle and the folks could hear the bells. And as they heard it, if, when all the bells were moving, all the bells was making a sound, it was a sweet sound. It wasn't the clashing sound. The bells were all working together. I'm just thinking how important it is in the church that all of us work together. Friday night, we're having a hot dogs and hamburgers. You know, it would be hard for all that to take place if it was on one person. But there were some that volunteered for lettuce, some that volunteered for tomatoes, some that volunteered for pickles, some that volunteered for Egyptian onions. Oh, that's where they came from. But anyway, I'm thinking for just a moment. Cookies. You say, Brother Aguilar, what took place? They're all working together. And you know what it's going to be? It's going to be a sweet sound when they said, come get it. It's going to be a... I'm just thinking about when the church works together. There's no big I's and little U's in the church. It's all of us beginning to work together. It's all of us going ahead and doing the will of God together. Oh, Sunday morning when services take place, it's all of us going ahead and coming in. All of us taking a part in the singing. All of us taking a part. Oh, praying. All of us taking a part in giving. All of us taking a part in work. It's all of us working together. That's what God's looking for. And as Aaron ministered before the Lord, I'm thinking about about the sound. I'm thinking about the people on the outside that heard the bells ringing, that went ahead and heard. It sounded so sweet. It sounded so good. Uh, Lord willing, Friday night I'll mention about two where it didn't sound right, where it wasn't right, and the bells stopped ringing. And you can find nothing but disaster and chaos. Could I ask you tonight, how are the bells sounding in your life? Are you a bell that's working with the other ones? 
Are you someone that's going ahead and trying to minister in the church together as one? I mentioned about the Bibles that are, are being sent out. It's not just one person, but it's everybody working together, different ones working together to get the job done. There are some folks that go ahead and print the Word of God. There are some that go ahead and buy the paper. Some they go ahead and collate, but it's all working together. Oh, the bells are ringing. And my, when somebody gets a copy of the Word of God, it might be their first copy of the Bible. Could you just imagine how sweet it must sound? How sweet it must be? Why? Because there were some folks that worked together. I'm noticing this ephod. So we notice the first part of the garment is it was pure and white. I ask you tonight, is your garment pure and white? Is it clean? The second part of the garment, we notice the ephod here, it had a sweet sound. It worked together with all the other ones. And I ask you, is your job here is your work here at the church working together i give you the last thing and i'm through we find this in exodus chapter 28 verse 9 through 30 i'm not going to read the whole thing but we got a breastplate on the front of judgment if you was to look at this breastplate now on the shoulders of aaron there were six stones for six of the tribes of israel on the other side there were six stones of the other six tribes of israel but on the breastplate, there were the 12 stones here. And it's interesting there in Exodus 28, verse 30, he says, Thou shalt put the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Phanim, they shall be put upon Aaron's heart and when he goeth before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Now, a lot of times we read over this and we kind of skip over this. But in this breastplate, there were two stones. There was, within this breastplate, 12 stones, but two of them, I'm breaking out tonight, don't have time to go into all 12, but two of them, one was a white stone, one was a black stone. One was called the Urim, the other was called the Thanum. And when I think about these stones, here it is, there was different things the children of Israel did not have any law for. Now, today, laws. there's different things laws that have been written down. There's different types of statutes that have been given, and we live according to those laws and statutes. But here, the children of Israel at this time, they had only ten laws, ten commandments. And as the days go on, God begins to go ahead and add more. God begins to go ahead, not more commandments, but he said, Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt do this, and thou shalt do this. And so more laws were given. But what takes place when somebody does something and they have a law for it? There's no law for it. And there is an example given in Exodus chapter 29 when a man, has went ahead and he's gathered sticks on the Sabbath day. Now I will say this, that some things were only given to the nation of Israel. Some things God said, I want this nation to be different from all other nations. And so God set apart the nation of Israel and put different laws and put different things on it that he did not put on Gentile nations. There was some things. You could have mixed uh, fabrics together with the nation of Israel, but you could do it with the Gentile nation. But the, the Jewish nation, they could not eat the pig, but I love bacon. You see, there were some things that was just given to the Jewish nation, some things that was given uh, to all men. But I'm thinking, here it is, the Sabbath day given to that Jewish nation that they might rest, that they might uh, go ahead and come away from all the work. And a man was gathering some sticks on the Sabbath day. And all of a sudden, folks begin to complain. You know, Baptists will complain about anything. You live for God, they'll complain about it. You don't live for God, they'll complain about it. You just don't do anything, they'll complain about it. And I don't know why, but here it is. Somebody started complaining. Somebody started saying, this man ought not to be uh, picking up sticks on the set. Somebody said, well, I don't see nothing wrong with it. Another person says, well, if he wants to do it, let him do it. And there was no law. So Aaron now goes 
before the Lord in that tabernacle, taking uh, that breastplate there on that ephod. And as he goes in, here are those two stones. There's a black stone. There's a white stone and uh, many other stones. But when he goes in, as Exodus chapter 28 brings out, for judgment to find out what does God say? Is he for this or is he against this? As he goes before the Lord, he would come out, and it would seem like if it was, if it was positive, that white stone would just be bright, and the black stone would be dull. If the answer was negative, that black stone would be so bright, and the white stone would be so dull. I'm noticing this is the thought that was given to determining the will of God for your life. Could I say this tonight, each and every one of us? We need to find out what God's will is for our life. And there's two ways for you to do it. God's giving you two different things to do it. The first, uh, the first uh, thought I think what he's given is the Holy Ghost of God. The Bible says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost of God, which is in you. Could I say if you're saved tonight, there's someone that came in that dwells in you. I want you to know that same person, he's the one that will bring conviction. He's the one that will go ahead and you get ready to do something. And boy, it seems like it smokes your heart. It seems like you feel awful. It seems like you feel guilty. That's the Holy Ghost of God telling you you shouldn't be going. But then he gives something else for us to determine the will of God. And could I say these two things will not never contradict each other. The first thing we notice is the Holy Ghost. The second thing we notice is the Word of God. You see, if you think, well, I go ahead and do this. I know the Bible says I shouldn't, but I'm, can I say you're going against the will of God. The Bible will never contradict the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost will never contradict the Bible. You see, what you should do in your life, you should let the Holy Ghost of God and the Word of God be the will of God for your life. Oh, if you get up in the morning here, uh, you say, Lord, I want you to show me what your will is. Uh, let the Word of God be the your guide. Let it be the, your, your mile markers and, and the posts. Uh, it, it might tell you to stop. It might tell you to turn. It might tell you to yield. Oh, you need to let the Word of God. It was this Word of God that began to show me what the will of God was. There are some things that is straightforward in the Word of God. What is God's will? You say, like what? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, and everything give thanks, for this is the will. God's will for you is that you won't be complaining, but that you'll be just giving thanks, even hard times, even bad times. You know, sometimes it's hard to thank God when things go wrong. Sometimes it's hard to thank God when it seems like that's going to cost some money. Sometimes it's hard to thank God when it seems like maybe some type of disease or some type of illness has hit our body. But in everything, we should give thanks. Now, it didn't say for everything, but it said in. While you're in that situation, while you're going through that problem, while you're going through whatever's taking place, you need to thank God for it. We was coming in. And it just so happened as we, we got close to Dyersburg, Tennessee, uh, I already called Brother Kiefer. I let him know we'll be in about such and such time. And here we're driving, got close to Dyersburg, and all of a sudden I started smelling something. And could I say, if you're driving a big rig, a big bus, smells is not what you like. And I started smelling, I'm thinking, what in the world? I'm looking in my mirrors to see if it's a tire. I'm, I'm looking, and I looked over at the old, old, old looks good hallelujah the gas tank looks good uh, uh, this the air looks good alternator the generator what keeps the batteries charged dropped and all of a sudden i'm thinking well i wonder what it is is it the belt is it the alternator and uh when we got over here we was able to take it off and come to find out it was an alternator we went down, I, and I ended up ordering an alternator. And I'm actually, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. I was praising God. It was $550. You 
You say, why? Because the last one was 1400 I don't know about you, but that's something to thank God. Boy, hallelujah, 500 What a blessing! You know what the Bible says in everything? Give thanks. Sometimes we don't understand it. I remember we had an accident about four years ago. Head-on collision with a little Kia. You know what a Kia is. Compared to that bus, it's like a Tonka toy. And yet it totaled out our camper. Not this camper, it totaled out the other camper. And I remember when I got out, now I didn't, I told my wife, I said, this could be a blessing. Here it is, we're stranded. But this sure could be a blessing. And God used that trial. God used the, that problem. He used that spot where we lost uh, the, the vehicle. We no longer had a home on the, uh, on the road. We, we, had to, uh, we, we was headed back home anyway. God, God allowed us to take a month and a half off anyway uh, for Christmas time. And, and uh, here I was just preaching around the area where our house was. And I, I'm thinking, uh, this could be a blessing. You know, I could have looked at it the wrong way. Why does that everything happen to me? Why is it? But God took that situation and today we have what we have. I'm saying the will of God involves thankfulness. You look at the will of God in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication. I'm thinking here, God has a perfect will for your life. I believe it's very important that we hold the will of God in our everyday life. Three thoughts of the, of the garment. First, the white linen. I'm asking you tonight, how is your spiritual garment? How does people see you? Are, is your garment white? The second thought here, not just having a white garment, but we notice here, uh, the, the, not just the, uh, the white linen, but the robe of the ephod. We notice here, it's nothing more than showing a sweet sound. Is your sound sweet in the ears of God? And then, is it showing the will of God? 1 Samuel 30, David's trying to get the will of God. He, he got into the field. Suddenly the enemy has now taken their children, they're taking their wives, everything they have. Ziglag is now burning with fire. All the men that was with David, they're thinking, let's stone David. It's David's fault that we did this. It's David's fault we lost our wives. And here David's thinking, Lord, what shall I do? And he told Abathur the priest, he said, bring me the ephod. And he asked the Lord, he said, shall I pursue after this truth? Lord, I need your will. Could I say this tonight? If you're looking for God's will, you need to cry out. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And then go to the word of God and allow the word of God and the Holy Ghost to show you what you need to do. I'm looking at the priest's garment. Is yours white? Is your garment a sweet sound? And is your garment tonight in the perfect will of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, tonight present your body to live in sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God the priest robes. Would you stand with me tonight, everyone? Standing, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Father, <laughs> Lord, is a royal priesthood, those that have been saved by the grace of God. Lord, there's folks looking at us every day, robe of righteousness, and they see Christ living in our lives, and they see the purity. Father, tonight it might be some here, they want to gather around the altar. Father, I pray they might come. Lord, I'm just wondering, is there a sweet sound? Are we working together? Are we doing the will of God together? Father, maybe some like to go ahead and just gather around this altar saying, Lord, I want to I want to get involved. I want to be a spot. Lord, are we doing what is right? Lord, is it the perfect will that you have for our life? Lord, maybe some need to gather around this altar and say, Lord, I want your perfect will in my life. Pray you might bless the invitation. Speak to hearts and lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Tonight God's speaking to your heart. 
wonder tonight, you would you just let the Lord have his way in your life? You might want to gather around this altar. It's a good place to come tonight. Hold this priest's robe. You're a royal priesthood. You ought to have this robe of righteousness that this world can see. You ought to be making the sweet sound. You ought to be doing the will of God. Won't you step out this evening? God's speaking to your heart. Piano's playing, and Father, I pray the will of God might be accomplished. Lord, tonight I preached. Lord, the thought that you gave to me many days ago for this night. Lord, I'm just wondering about our garments. Can folks see Jesus living in us? Or do they see the garbage, the distractions of the world? Lord, I'm just wondering tonight, are we making that sweet sound? Are we blending in together? Lord, is there turmoil? Is there a lot of problems? Is there all between a brother or a sister? Lord, we need to be making a sweet sound before you. Lord, we need to be doing your perfect will. I pray, God, you might have your perfect will tonight in the service. Lord, in just a moment, as a congregation, we'll be singing the verse of invitation. Folks need to step out. Lord, I haven't mentioned much about it, but you love folks so much. You died for them. Might be one here they've never been saved. May they come to Christ. Lord, if they're willing to step out tonight, somebody can help them and show them the way of salvation. Bless this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. She's playing hymn number 375 in your songbook. Tonight you want to gather around this altar. We're going to sing this verse of invitation. Won't you come? 375. Would you sing with me? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make after thy will, while I am waiting, yield it and still. Have thy way, Lord, have thy way. Search me and try me, Master. say to me today. 
God, what would you have me to do? God, would you have your way in my life? Show me something. Reveal something to me that, that I could do better, do differently, do more, not do it all. Because this isn't religion. This is relationship. What, what Brother Dale has been trying to teach and preach through the through the messages this week, what I try to teach and preach here at the church house is relationship. See, this is about religion, just doing some things and checking them off on our list and moving on with our with our life. It's about a relationship. God is a person. The Lord Jesus Christ, his son, died for us. He sacrificed for us. He gave himself for us. He wants to be close to us. As we've heard throughout the week, he desires, he loves us and wants to have a good relationship with us. But the problem is we're sinners. We've messed up. We probably messed up today. We might have even messed up in the last hour or two. So we were on the tip. I know. Just understand how a holy God might feel about that. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood and what that might mean to him. But we add to that burden. You're making me feel guilty right now. Well, I, I didn't make you do anything, including be guilty. You, you got that way on your own. God that we're talking about and that we're learning about and that we're singing to that we came to meet with he, he's, he's not a tree stone he's not some stone carving he's not some figment of, of human imagination he's the creator of all things 